Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, let me start by wishing you, on behalf of all of us here at the Center for Global Development, a uh, safe and uh, healthy and uh, happy uh, 2022. And what better way to start the year than to have a conversation with uh, Kristalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the IMF, uh, uh, to get her perspective on the outlook for this year, the risks and challenges, and, and the agenda for the IMF, the institution that uh, she heads, and, and that has such an important role to play in, in supporting the global uh, economy and the recovery from this pandemic. Uh, Kristalina, welcome. Uh, it's great to see you. Happy New Year to you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here, and uh, I thought let me I would just start off by really asking you to say a little bit about, you know, how do you, uh, looking ahead, see this year? Uh, I know a year ago you were talking about a dangerous divergence. Uh, I know that the IMF's own uh, numbers for the year are going to come out in a couple of weeks, but uh, the World Bank came out with some numbers yesterday. Others are coming out, and uh, the. The both the sort of scaling down of, of prospects, but more importantly, the risks that we see and the uh, divergences are, are very visible. So I wanted to sort of give you an opportunity first to give us your perspective on that. Thank you very much, uh, much Masood. Thank you for having me. A happy new year to everybody. I wish you good health and good fortunes. Uh, I would have liked very much uh, to have a uh, more optimistic uh, outlook at the beginning of the year, but reality is uh, we are looking into a uh, somewhat weaker momentum of the recovery and higher uncertainties, more risks in 2022. Uh, to give you the uh, the perspective from the fund already towards the end of the previous year, we were concerned that the recovery was weakening. Why? Because the two big engines of the world economy, the US and China, both were slowing down vis-a-vis -vis projections from the summer. And now we also have Omicron. For us at the fund, it is not a surprise that there is a new wave. We have been uh, talking about the importance of staying vigilant on COVID, and we continue to promote building defenses against COVID as a primary economic objective. Why? Because what we see is that when these defenses are in place, the reduction in mobility is lower, the functioning of the economies are higher. So we are uh, very much keen that in 2022, we continue to place this build up of defenses uh, as a priority on the agenda. When we look into the uh, prospects for the year, there are three things that stand up. One, this dangerous divergence I was talking about, my colleagues at the fund have been talking about, unfortunately is deepening. And it is driven by two factors. One, how strong are your defenses against COVID? Two, how much do you have as policy space to boost your businesses and uh, support your households, especially the vulnerable ones. So advanced economies, a small number of, of emerging market economies are doing relatively better. Uh, we see catch up with pre-COVID levels in quite a number of countries, but the rest of the world is sleeping further behind. Why is this dangerous? Because it adds to the uh, constraints to a more potent recovery. And it adds to interruptions of supply chains. It adds to, to problems that have the uh, ability to travel around the globe. 
Our second concern, not surprisingly, especially in light of the inflation numbers uh, that just came up, is inflation. Uh, it is being pushed up in some countries. Let's be very clear. It is not a universal phenomenon, but in quite a number of countries, and especially in the US, it is a problem because of demand supply mismatches, because of uh, pressures that are coming from changes in the labor market, and because of shocks coming from climate that have impacted food prices, agricultural productivity in quite a number of places. Now, inflation can be handled and central banks know how to do it. But there are two problems with it. One, the delicate balancing act, the Fed and other central banks that are pressured uh, like the UK and others uh, have to achieve between fighting inflation and sustaining the recovery. And two, because of the spillover impacts on emerging markets. And that can add fuel to the fire of divergence. And the third issue that, that we are uh, quite concerned about is debt. Uh, it has gone up dramatically during the pandemic, not surprisingly. Uh, we have never seen such a boost in debt levels since the Second World War. Now, if you take public and private debt uh, uh, collectively at 256% of GDP, debt is particularly heavy on countries with weaker fundamentals and higher debt levels. Uh, and especially uh, that concerns low income countries. But if last year you would hear me talking about low income countries, this year there are emerging markets that also would be in this category. Now you put all this uh, together and you recognize uh, that it is a year in which Yes, the recovery is likely to continue, but against stronger winds. And uh, one of these winds is something that uh, we had in, in uh, 2019, street protests, unrest. This is coming back and uh, uh, it would make uh, the uh, life of policymakers much more complicated. Uh, so, what do we count on? We count on continuous policy consultations and coordination, and we count on focusing on country specific policies because no more we are in a world of universal answers as it was uh, in the uh, uh, first uh, months of the pandemic. We are now in a world of very differentiated conditions in. Uh, uh, different uh, countries that require careful, thoughtful policy response. So, as you said, we, we wish we could have started with a more optimistic outlook for the year, but I think it is very important to put on the table both the slowing, the divergence, the risks, and the spillover risks as well that you mentioned. Uh, maybe I'll just drill down a bit on one of the points you raised, which is about uh, the resurgence of the, or the continuation, I should say, of the pandemic in many countries with Omicron now as a new uh, variant, and, and certainly not the last variant mm -hmm. we're going to see. You remember uh, the IMF has a role, obviously, in the big macro sense supporting countries, but a year and a bit ago, there was a discussion about the IMF also providing support to countries to acquire vaccines and, and to the uh, COVAX and the ACT Accelerator. And uh, everybody agreed that grants were best uh, if you could get them. If you couldn't get grants, it would be good to get sort of uh, multilateral development banks providing long-term concessional money. But if you couldn't get that, you know, the IMF could provide uh, funding on concessional terms for, for countries to be able to buy their their vaccines when they need them. And now here we are, uh, uh, beginning of 2022, and, and uh, the ACT Accelerator still has a gap of uh, $23 billion. And, and 
I wanted to get a little sense from you of sort of where do we stand with this idea of having a vaccine window in the IMF that would be able to provide countries with support if they couldn't mobilize grants and, and also putting in place for the longer term, a sort of pandemic response window before going on to other topics. Uh, very important point. We did consider creating a special window for pandemic uh, response, uh, but what we actually did that was going in the same direction of helping countries, in my view, was even better. The $650 billion new SDR allocation, uh, because it does not add to the debt of countries, and yet it provides space. Uh, and some countries did use this space to push up their health uh, spending, especially uh, in the context of uh, vaccination programs. Uh, there is also one very interesting example, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we see more of it. Uh, Senegal uh, chose to take a part of their new S SDR allocation to uh, add it to financing to expand vaccine production. As uh, probably everybody on this call knows, uh, uh, Institute uh, uh, Pasteur Dakar is a very competent institution that has been in vaccine production for many decades. Uh, and Senegal is now going to build up uh, uh, capacity. In my view, this is hugely important for this pandemic, but also for pandemics to come, to have more diversified production uh, capabilities. Uh, so in the case of Africa, for Africa to be able to vaccinate uh, Africa, uh, rather than being dependent only on imports. Uh, looking forward, we, as you know, are working on the creation of resilience and sustainability trust. This would be a addition to the instruments of the IMF, specifically designed to help long-term structural transformation. And as the name indicates, build resilience to shocks to come. And in this uh, uh, instrument, we do uh, propose that uh, pandemic preparedness is an element of eligibility for countries. Uh, actually, we are going to have on Friday a discussion with our board. Uh, uh, and, I, and I do hope that uh, we would retain this broader objective. Uh, it would be uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 billion. Uh, in other words, a uh, relatively uh, sizable uh, a fund and it may go even higher depending on uh, how successful we are and how much demand there is right. for it. So I'll, I'll come back to the RST, the, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, uh, in, in a minute, if I may. But ju just stay for a minute on, on the uh, vaccine window. So, you know, my one worry about the SDRs is that, that that's being used for so many different purposes over and over again. So in a way, you can only use them once. And, and I was thinking that you know, today, we still have uh, this gap of 23 billion. And obviously, most of it should be filled by grants. That's, that's the right answer to it. But sometimes the grants take a long time. So I just wonder whether mm -hmm. for the immediate, for the now, is there some merit in having a kind of one-time vaccine financing capacity that countries could draw upon? We are discussing that. Uh, we haven't uh, completely abandoned uh, this idea. Uh, what I'm describing is the sequence of actions yes. we have taken. And so we are looking at this uh, as well. Uh, what we expect for this year is that we might see an increase in demand for uh, IMF financing that stems from the tightening of financial conditions uh, last year, the year before, availability of cheap financing meant that uh, uh, demand for the fund uh, for financing uh, has been uh, still sizable, but uh, way, way within our capacity. Just to give the numbers, uh, our lending over the last two years uh, has been uh, 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 170 billion dollars, of which about uh, uh, 
104 billion went for very important instrument for precautionary uh, lending. And I would expect there may be more demand for it this right. year. Uh, some 32 billion went for the traditional uh, World Bank um, upper credit tranche uh, programs. And uh, the rest around 34 billion was emergency financing. Now, why I'm putting this, uh, these numbers because it gives you a sense that if we are in a world where access to, to cheap credit is more limited, uh, pressure of debt is higher, then we need to, to brace for possibly uh, more demand. And we have to think about the instruments we deploy in that uh, new context. Exactly, and, and I think, you know, in a way, let, let, maybe we can move on to that because if you think about last year, the last two years, as you were saying, you know, there's been a big increase in the number of countries that have come to the IMF for support, particularly, but not only for emergency uh, financing. But while the low income countries uh, is where the, the, the volume of outstanding fund credit has doubled in the emerging markets, mm -hmm. uh, for the reasons you outlined, it only went up by about a third or so. So now in 2022, uh, you're thinking that that's where you're going to see some more, or you might well see some more demand because of tightening market conditions that affect the EMs. We have to be prepared for that. Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, uh, as uh, a lender of last resort, uh, we much prefer for countries not to have to come uh, yes. to fund, uh, to be able to meet their financial needs um, uh, through domestic um, uh, borrowing and uh, uh, Revenues, revenues mobilization and external financing at a relatively low cost. Uh, but we have to be prepared that uh, there may be uh, more uh, turbulence. Uh, as a crisis manager, our job is to always think of the worst case scenario, be prepared uh, for it. And of course, pray that it is not going to, uh, to happen. And in this year, in 22, um, there could be a, um, movement around that that is more uh, pronounced. Uh, there could be some uh, of this divergence impacts uh, already uh, demonstrably affecting uh, countries. And as I said, it would be in a very, uh, uh, very complex uh, political context. We need to remember that these two years have been difficult. Right. Uh, and they have been taxing on, on societies. And now we are coming into a period of time when uh, uh, this taxing starts bubbling up in, uh, in the form of uh, unrest. Yes. Uh, so <clears throat> taking policy actions uh, when you, you actually are in the year of, of withdrawal, withdrawing policy support gradually, uh, that is going to be really, really uh, difficult. So we have to uh, steer our work, one on the policy side in our surveillance towards understanding what are the conditions, what is best for countries to do. And then two, we need to be uh, ready should uh, there is a, a demand for the fund uh, to step right. forward potentially to do that. So we let, still let's have talk capacity. We still have 700 billion capacity. Yes, exactly. And in a way, I mean, this is my personal view is that if you come through the worst uh, global pandemic in you know, three generations, and at the end of it, we still haven't used much of the capacity of the institution we globally have set up to deal with crisis, mm -hmm. then that's not a good outcome. That, that you know, in a way we need to be able to find ways to use it, uh, use it productively and use it well, but use it. Uh, can, I, can I go a little bit to another point you raised, which is debt. Mm -hmm. So debt problems been simmering now for, and building up, as you said, the numbers are growing around, but low income countries in particular, uh, now some emerging markets also looking a little bit more uh, vulnerable. Over the last year, a year or so ago, we, the 
G20 and working with you, working with the World Bank, uh, set up the common framework, which was supposed to help countries uh, deal with this issue uh, of, of unsustainable levels of debt. A year passed, not really very fast progress. Three countries sort of worked their way into it. Not one has yet actually come out. Um, and you wrote a blog uh, with Jayla uh, Pazar Bashioglu uh, a, a month ago, sort of saying, look, here are some things that need to be done to make the common framework work better. And then some very sensible ideas. The World Bank uh, has talked about transparency. So, so the diagnosis is there. And we have a very nice menu now of the things that need to be done to make this common framework actually work, operationalize it and be better. I guess my question to you is, so we all understand now the problem and what needs to be done, but how do you see that getting done this year? You know, why is it that in six months time, or we will, have actually addressed those issues that you and, and others have so rightly put on the table? We have to relentlessly pursue improvements in uh, debt management. And what I uh, hope for is that with the uh, debt bells ringing in our ears, there would be more commitment and desire uh, to move forward. Uh, we are taking uh, our proposals together with the World Bank to our boards, to the G20. Uh, as we know, the common framework is, is a G20 uh, creation. And uh, working also individually with uh, the key uh, parties, uh, both on the uh, public sector side and on the private sector side, so we can generate a sense of urgency to act. My uh, conviction is that we must pursue that transparency as a foundation for more engagement of public and private sector lenders. Why? Because one of the constraints we face is that sense that nobody wants to be cheated, that the interest in compatibility of treatment we can only achieve compatibility of treatment if we know what the debt composition is. And as I'm sure you, you are aware, at the IMF, we have uh, strengthened our policy requirements uh, with regard to debt reporting. So we can be forcing to also with the engagement, we have more transparency uh, and uh, that that is a precondition for success. Of course, uh, the second uh, uh, one is uh, political will. Uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 we spent a lot of time engaging on generating this political will. Uh, we are also telling uh, the uh, uh, borrowers, speak up, uh, make sure that your voice is heard because it is your fortune on the line. Uh, and we have seen, yes, these three, three cases, none of them is completed, but we have seen uh, quite a lot of progress to a great degree also driven by Chad, by Zambia, engaging at the highest level of their authorities, because ultimately a debt deal is a deal between creditors and debtors. We can provide uh, the objective information to base this deal on but it is their agreement. Uh, and so uh, we will see that moving. But at least let me make a point beyond the common framework. I don't think even if we make the common framework work, we are going to be done. Why? Because uh, the common way framework covers only the so-called DSSI countries, countries that were eligible right. for service suspension. Well, this is not the whole universe of countries that would need uh, that attention to, to debt and uh, some of them debt restructuring. So how we continue to improve the uh, uh, global architecture remains a priority. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to uh, David Malpas for being a strong voice uh, on that same topic. We have been uh, uh, really uh, jointly 
forcing more attention. Right. Uh, and we are also looking into country by country, what are the likely risks uh, as part of our surveillance uh, function. So countries act early. You know it, Masood, when it is already a default time, it's late. Actions need to be taken much earlier uh, to reduce the cost. And our analysis shows that when you go for default and only then you act, the long-term impact on, on GDP, on growth uh, is uh, of course much worse. Right. And in fact, as you said, you know, the common framework was sort of an outgrowth of the initial DSSI, the effort to suspend debt service for a subset of 70 odd countries of which some 40 actually took advantage of it. Um, but one of the recommendations I thought that you and, and Jayla had made in your blog was exactly to extend yep. its coverage yes. to other countries as well, because some were not, uh, some countries that do have debt problems are not covered at the moment. And of course the DSSI itself, the suspension of debt service, is, has come to an end. Yep. So in, an, in terms of additional pressure on countries, uh, balance of payments, one thing to add on is that the debt service that over the last two years or so they have not had to pay, mm -hmm. they're going to have to add on to their outgoing starting with this month. So all the more reason to, to accelerate work on that. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I agree that uh, one way to address the uh, limitations of the common framework is to expand the common framework to cover countries that would need some form of debt uh, treatment. Uh, we can uh, move on that only with the agreement of the countries of that are, are in the common framework. Uh, but if that is not done, then the question is what else? What's your other instrument? What is so at the moment, it's basically the old style, get yeah. into default, yes. come to the fund for support, yeah. In that process, work it out. This is very yeah. slow, tedious, and and economically costly for yeah. for countries, exactly. and actually, ultimately, for the creditors. Uh, one yeah. of the lessons from this is that creditors don't gain from. That's what we're telling everybody. Uh, it is in your own interest to get more yeah. organized. Uh, it would be cheaper for you. Uh, and some hear this, and others are less uh, amenable to this argument. Uh, and I am. Uh, more and more convinced that uh, the uh, mobilization of uh, political will uh, is uh, uh, the key to unlock uh, more decisive yeah. Yeah. Let, Let's move a bit from debt to the other topic you raised, which is the Resilience and Sustainability Trust. I want to come back to that. So, let, I mean, just to step back from it for a minute, I mean, there's a much bigger issue of many, almost every developing country having to go through major transformation to adapt to a new low carbon future for the world and for itself. And this is going to be both adaptation for many of them, but for others, it'll actually be a contribution in terms of mitigating emissions and so a different strategy. And there's a bigger question of sort of, what is the IMF's role in this? Mm -hmm. And then, to what extent is the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, if you like, your lead instrument to help countries with this effort? And I think there's a, I would, I think it's fair to say that there is both a sort of eager anticipation of more information about this Resilience and Sustainability Trust, but also a little bit of uh, skepticism that people say, well, look, at the end of the day, you know, this is going to be small stuff, 30 billion or 50 billion sounds a lot, but if you spread it over countries, it's a one-time payment over, probably dispersed over eight or 10 or some years, it's not, and it has to go alongside a regular fund program probably, so it may not actually have much demand. So uh -huh. give us your take yeah. on how you, what's your good outcome mm -hmm. for the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, knowing that it's not done yet. It's a year from being done, probably. But what would you like to come out? 
let me uh, start from the first part of your question. What is the role of the fund uh, when we talk about climate uh, change? Uh, very clearly, climate change is macro-critical, both as a risk to macroeconomic and financial stability and as an opportunity for transformative green growth. And that squarely fits in the mandate of the fund, uh, which is macroeconomic financial stability, growth and employment. When we embrace climate change, and by the way, it, it was done with the strategy approved by our board with quite a consistent support. Well, some much more enthusiastically, but no, no one uh, in the end would say, oh, it is wrong for the fund to do it because we see it with our eyes. It is happening. It has dramatic impact uh, on economies and uh, livelihoods. Uh, and we have to take advantage of action to create uh, more opportunities uh, for, for employment. When I, when I look at the instruments of the fund, in fact, the most powerful one is surveillance. Because when we include climate considerations for uh, high emitting countries around mitigation, for highly vulnerable countries around adaptation, what are, or for transitioned countries, countries that are relying on hydrocarbons, how to make that transition uh, most productive for their societies. Bringing this notion of mainstreaming climate in good policy making uh, and also bringing it as a uh, consideration for finance uh, authorities, for those that we mostly work with, uh, that is the most uh, uh, significant contribution I believe we make. Uh, when you look at the programs of the fund around climate, they are structured in four areas and they are all uh, uh, very important. And, and, and in that sense, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust is important, but, but it is not the uh, heart of our work. First, it is in our fiscal affairs uh, work, obviously uh, carbon uh, price, how you go about it, uh, how, how you go about public investments. We have introduced a new instrument, which is climate public investment management strategies that integrate climate uh, into them. The second block is in uh, monetary uh, policy, how we can make climate related financial stability risks well integrated in FSAPs, well integrated in uh, the work we do. The third element is uh, around uh, the fairness of transition, and it goes into how the international community can fulfill its obligations to developing countries, as well as what policies for public spending are most appropriate to generate a fairness in societies as the transition, transition goes forward. So those, those that, that, that are losing from this transition uh, are compensated with uh, well thought through instruments. And then comes financing. And, the, and this is where the uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust comes into play. At this point of time, our ambition is to create an instrument that is focused on policy support. And it is in a way piloting the trans transmission from Article 4 and surveillance to what we support with financing. Uh, my expectation is that uh, uh, we will have the design by the spring meetings. I hear your, your points. Uh, that is, uh, we have, to, again, it's a balancing, uh, balancing act for us because on one side, uh, we have to guarantee the reserve asset quality of the SDRs that would be um, on landed through the RST. And on the other side, we have to make sure that financially, this is a viable proposition that you know, countries would be able to, uh, to pay back over a long period of time. Um, on the conditionality uh, point, uh, actually, 
there is broadly speaking consensus that this is policy lending and it would be with some uh, policy conditions because that's the whole point to support good policies in countries. Uh, we, for countries that are with programs, it would be relatively easy to connect. We are going to make sure that we are not penalizing countries with strong fundamentals uh, and there would be a mechanism to make sure that they can access uh, this uh, financing. And on the size, look, uh, it may grow if it, is, if it is a good instrument and the demand is there. And by the way, we are very mindful that the, the, the conditions we attach should not be of a kind that creates stigma and pushes countries away uh, from engaging with us but that they're helpful for countries uh, to take the right transition turn. Uh, we also might see over time, more of these policy uh, issues being integrated in the traditional instruments of the fund, where countries genuinely are interested. Uh, and I can tell you there are many countries, especially on the adaptation side, that are already quite eager to see programs, and in some of them, we, we already touch on that uh, policy issue, how, how to help countries to be more resilient to climate shocks. You, you could actually argue that if the transformation of an economy to a new lower carbon world is indeed going to be as fundamental as many of us think it will be, mm -hmm. then it's not very hard to imagine that there could be an IMF supported mm -hmm. program that doesn't take on board that transformation. And over time, it's mm -hmm. hard to see how you could sort of ring fence in a way the, the climate part of the transformation and macro. So the, if the whole point is to integrate that climate into macro, then over time, that's what a regular IMF supported program in countries would exactly. need to take on board. You know, it's like any other major exactly. transformation, right? It's uh, this, exactly, this is exactly the, the case. Uh, I had a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, as always um, uh, engaging conversation with Larry Summers on this, on this exact point. And Larry would say, well, but you know, Kristalina, you should take your whole lending capacity right. and make sure it is tuned appropriately. Uh, and what I explained uh, to him, and I would like to explain to the audience, is that we are very prudent, in, and you know that uh, very well, we are very prudent as to how we built the foundation for the fund financial engagement on policy issues. We have done it through the history of the fund. Right. Step number one is always understanding the policy uh, uh, context. In other words, build it in surveillance, and then, when you build it in surveillance, it moves towards uh, the uh, financial, uh, the, the programs, if programs are in place. What we are doing with the RST, we are addressing a specific shortcoming of our lending instruments that we do not have a longer maturity, longer grace period instrument to support structural transformations that do require a long period of time. Exactly. So we are filling this gap and uh, uh, we are building the expertise so we can be supportive of our members that are keen to accelerate this transformation. So, so let's then take, that takes us into what, what I want to see is sort of two sets of issues that people raise about the direction of the fund and, and the performance of the fund over the past uh, few years. Uh, both under your leadership and, and also to some extent under uh, uh, Chrissy's and when she was here at Lagarde's. Uh, so the, the first is, you know, these are all really important issues. Climate is important, pandemics are important, but what's it got to do with the core business of the IMF? You know, this is, uh, shouldn't look at this inflation. There's uh, issues around global uh, macro imbalances, and, and that's really what the IMF should stick to its knitting, that's its core strength over the years, and this attempt to sort of broaden it out and put everything into it by the, the using this, this uh, guise of sort of macro criticality 
kind of runs the risk of making the IMF less effective. So I think it would be good to get your response to that. Uh, I always welcome debate and uh, we never take at the front uh, uh, what we believe are our responsibilities lightly. We always engage with uh, uh, different points of views. Uh, on this one, of course, we have to be there for the membership on these key issues of inflation, debt, macro stability, of course. And we have not abandoned uh, our duties. It is actually the heart of our conversation today. Uh, we, we do have highly uh, qualified people that are working uh, day and night uh, on these issues. But the world is changing and it is impossible to ignore this change. Uh, just to give you one analog, uh, when we moved out of the uh, gold standard uh, to flexible exchange rates, is it for the fund to say, oh, well, no, gold standard is what we know, gold standard is what we support, gold standard is what we do, of course, no. And when the uh, uh, former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, their economic system collapsed, the fund had to engage on industrial restructuring. It had to have programs that are around phasing out non-viable uh, industries that it didn't have to that extent before. Now we are at the point when there are macro trends that are very powerful and ignoring them would mean disservice to the membership. The first one is climate. There is simply no way for any institution to be ignorant about climate change and the policies that are necessary to adapt, to mitigate. And I want to stress that to take advantage of one's in a lifetime transformational opportunity. The second one is digitalization. Uh, we have just uh, finished uh, uh, discussions at the fund on our role of digital money. Obviously, this is core mandate. Nobody can say, oh, doesn't matter. Maybe the whole world is going to move into digital, uh, but uh, uh, not for us at the fund. So, so we, have to, we have to accept more responsibilities around central bank digital currencies, around uh, uh, the uh, risks associated and the opportunities associated with um, a stable coin e-monies and what is the role of uh, uh, the whole uh, universe around, uh, uh, around, around Bitcoin and other forms of uh, crypto money. And we're doing that. So my, my main point uh, here is that we have to serve the world of tomorrow. And of course, based on the knowledge and capacity we have accumulated from the world of yesterday and today. And that requires expanding our horizon, but always, always focusing on the test. Are we the institution that is most meaningfully contributing to this particular topic. Uh, take, for example, the issue of uh, uh, carbon price. Obviously, this is an area where the fund has tremendous expertise. It is deploying this expertise. And uh, some of the proposals we are making, like for international carbon uh, price uh, floor, are, see, are seen as very, very credible and attractive. Of course, uh, when we talk about climate-related financial stability risks, why do we have the FSAPs? They are to identify uh, financial stability risks and we are deploying them accordingly. Uh, but we should not venture out of our competence. Like I don't see ever the fund being in investment financing, uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, an institution that joins uh, others in building specific sectoral investment expertise. That would never, never be viable and of course shouldn't happen. Uh, so, and, and then and there, there is also some skepticism around the work we do on inclusion. But again, 
research is clear, more inclusive uh, societies, they tend to be uh, more economically uh, effective. When there is a great degree, degree of inequality, it undermines productivity and growth. So we have to be uh, there for these issues that are significant and where our expertise properly deployed helps the world do better. Well, you know, my personal bias on this is, is, is very much in line with that, but, but I want to also sort of make sure that I put the other mm -hmm. uh, perspective on it, which is that to say, and the only, if the examples of where the fund has gone into financial sector or into poverty reduction uh, as an area where traditionally didn't do that, and then it became clear it needed to do that, has been to work strongly in partnership yes. with yeah. other institutions and particularly the World Bank. Yes. And, and I guess one of the questions that people have also is in the space of climate, how do you see that partnership playing out in over as the years move on. You know, the World Bank is scaling up its work on, on climate as it should. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fund for all the reasons you've said needs to be more involved in the macro aspects of climate uh, change. Uh, how do you see those two institutions working together? The FSAP as you mentioned, uh, the FSAP yeah. of course, for those who, who don't follow it is a joint IMF World Bank product. The poverty reduction and growth strategies initially were a joint product. Uh, debt uh, sustainability analyses are a joint product. And in climate, I'm assuming you have similar ideas to take forward. Be good to hear that. Uh, we have worked uh, with, uh, with the World Bank, uh, for example, specifically on the Resilience and Sustainability Trust to establish how we can collaborate and we recognize the bank has much stronger footing uh, on climate. Uh, we take advantage of the work they do. They are now introducing a new instrument uh, that is looking into uh, sustainability uh, with more attention paid to climate risks and, and opportunities. Uh, and when they do it at the country level, that becomes the anchor for our own work. Uh, we have, we have, our two teams have actually agreed on how to work together around the resilience and sustainability uh, trust, and more broadly, how to cooperate uh, on this very important agenda. We actually have put in place a commission, uh, Nick Stern is uh, participating, uh, we have uh, a jailer from our side and uh, Marie uh, uh, from the bank side, co-chairing it to define what are the issues and what are the comparative strengths we bring, how to partner uh, better. And it goes beyond the World Bank. We have uh, strong uh, links, uh, uh, for example, on adaptation in Africa with the African Development Bank. Uh, they have stepped up in this uh, uh, area. We are not going to be repeating work or duplicating work done by others. Our objective is to bring knowledge to our members that are our natural partners, and these are mostly in the finance, uh, central banking uh, arena. And I can tell you that demand for capacity development from these institutions towards the fund has quite significantly increased. Uh, it is for us such a key moment in the history of human race that it calls for virtually all hands on deck and for each and every institution to honestly and clearly identify what is our role, how it complements the role of others uh, and how we can collectively, collectively do more because frankly, <laughs> there is plenty to be done. So <laughs> No shortage, no shortage of work, but you're absolutely right. We are very mindful that, uh, especially as a newcomer, we have to look at the um, uh, those that are already already there, make sure that we complement. Don't repeat, don't compete. And fill, fill the gaps because there are clearly yeah. gaps. Yeah. So let, let, I, we're running towards the uh, end of our time and I, I want to go to one other uh, issue. 
you know, conditionality in IMF programs is uh, is one that a topic that excites a lot of interest amongst uh, people. And most of the stuff that is written about the IMF conditionality is that you know, it's too harsh at times. It doesn't take into account country circumstances. It's uh, uh, recently, though, and from time to time, you see this. Recently, you might, I'm sure, you've seen the. Uh, a piece that Ken Rogoff, former chief economist of the IMF, uh, wrote saying, you know, is the IMF trying to become an aid agency and you need to return to forceful conditionality uh, for the reasons that <clears throat> articulated well by, by Ken. And I guess my question to you is not the sort of abstract discussion of conditionality, but do you think that over the past two years or so, um, the IMF has so sort of lost its grip on conditionality, that we're basically turning money out, you're turning money out uh, without worrying about uh, how it's going to actually help countries to become stronger, to repay that uh, financing to you and to, and to others. So how, how do you respond to this, you know, that don't be an aid agency criticism? The, well, every crisis uh, requires uh, appropriate appropriate diagnostics, what is the crisis and appropriate response. This crisis is really like no other. And I believe IMF staff diagnosed it appropriately in the very beginning of the crisis, both supply and demand shock, economies brought to a standstill, those who have the, the means to support businesses and people do it, but those who don't need help and they need help urgently. So I take pride of what we have done. We have provided 34 billion of emergency financing, uh, which to my mind is absolutely not excessive. We have provided it to countries that really had no other place to turn to. Uh, in this uh, month of April, I vividly remember getting calls from prime ministers, from presidents, grateful that the fund moved swiftly. Uh, one call I got uh, came for the president at 2 a.m. in the morning for this particular president, because this is when he got the news that the country received uh, emergency financing. And it was so touching because what he said to me was, our revenues, evaporated, our expenditures have jumped up, and what you're doing for us is really life-saving. So we have to remember that we did the right thing at the right time. As the crisis advanced to a point when there was better understanding of how to keep the economies functioning, even with the, the pandemic still around us, as the economy started reopening, uh, we, uh, you know, basically we didn't stop, but we very sharply reduced emergency financing. And if you look at the uh, uh, programs we have, they're very traditional programs with conditionalities. And again, I have spent quite a number of hours uh, being pressed that we are too harsh and we are asking for too much. Uh, so we have 32 uh, programs, 21 new programs, 11 uh, augmentations. Again, we are talking about a short period of time. The fund has done 90, 90 financing arrangements. Some of them were really timely and sound uh, when they are precautionary uh, uh, lending. Uh, conditions, they, conditions have to be right. It is not about being too harsh or too soft. They have to be right they have to be right in the context of uh, countries. And let's remember, I don't think the world has ever experienced uh, what we are experiencing now. After two difficult years, we are stepping in a third year of tightening of financial conditions, of withdrawal of policy support, gradual, but withdrawal. This is, Conditions that we will, we will have, they have to fit this specific moment in time. Uh, they have to be the right uh, conditions. Uh, and I, again, I welcome uh, Ken Rogoff's uh, input. We do want to hear from, uh, from uh, everybody. I do believe, however, that uh, if you look at the data, 
the data is very clear, 170 billion uh, lending, 34 billion emergency financing, the rest traditional IMF uh, lending. That is where, these are the facts, this is where we are. And again, for, uh, 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 there is this criticism, but there is also a very loud applaud for the staff of the, of the fund. And I'm not talking here about me, I'm talking about my colleagues who working from home, doing negotiations over weeks in different time zones have delivered for the membership. Uh, when we were at the annual meetings uh, this year, it so much touched me that in the end of the meetings, uh, our governors uh, gave the staff of the fund a round of applause. Doesn't happen very often. I do believe it was well earned. Right. So I want to, um... I think that's a, that's a very important point. I think the useful piece of work for somebody in the fund perhaps to do is to look at the countries that got the emergency financing in the first year mm. and see if their ability to repay those funds mm. is weaker today or better as a result of having had that financing at the right time. In a way, one could argue about that. Uh, and, and I think the the argument that you made, at least to me, is 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 very uh, compelling. I want to end, Christine, by kind of stepping back a little bit and, and looking at now you're getting to the sort of halfway mark, uh, two years and a bit uh, here. Uh, you just had a a, a fairly uh, extensive uh, renewal in your management uh, team. You know, you had new three new. Uh, uh, deputies uh, uh, have taken office uh, or are about to take office, one of whom being uh, Gita Gopinath, who was the chief economist. You're getting uh, a, a very eminent uh, macroeconomist to come in and take over from her. Uh, so now you've sort of got your, your team in place. And, and I want to say, you know, you're looking out now for the next two years and a bit. And, and what, is, what is it that's driving you? What's mm -hmm. motivating you? What's your, what would you like to see uh, done over the, the second half of your first uh, uh, term at the head of the IMF? Uh, well, thanks for this question. Uh, let me just uh, make one little footnote on the issue of emergency financing uh, to give confidence to those interested in this topic that even in emergency financing, we have helped countries fix problems. It's not like, oh, here is the check and go away. We don't want to know what you did with the money. We have requested audits and we are drawing lessons from emergency financing. I take your point uh, to heart. We would look into this, uh, how, how we answer this question. Uh, we have a fantastic team uh, at the fund. Uh, for the first time, we have actually three women and two men at the uh, very top. Uh, Gita is uh, incredible. I'm so, so thrilled that she has uh, agreed to stay in this uh, position. And uh, uh, we are getting, as you said, a fantastic uh, chief economist. This is a team that builds on each other's strengths and builds this collective leadership of an institution at a time of increased uncertainties. What I want to see is that the fund is trusted by the members to provide the advice that is necessary in an agile and adaptable manner, that we are true to our origin, but we are also true to the times we live in fast changing, more disruptive times. And that when we finish this year, we can look back and say, okay, we have made it easier for governments, easier for people to navigate this complex uh, uh, time. As for the uh, end of term uh, objective, uh, um, I actually, have this uh, uh, strong conviction that uh, the privilege of my time 
is to work with the team of the IMF. Incredibly committed people. Uh, I saw their strength, but I saw how much they are a family during this uh, uh, COVID uh, times. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, uh, I would be most uh, grateful if I had done my part within this team for the fund to be highly effective and highly regarded as a result. Kristalina Georgiev, thank you very much for, for taking the time. Thank you for sharing that, including that very personal reflection that you just shared with us. It's always a, a, a privilege for us to, to be able to talk to you. And I hope that we will have a chance to, to repeat uh, this uh, uh, soon, because as you say, the world is going through a very uncertain moment. And you know the, the normal rhythm of how long you could wait before you had a, a, a stock take probably no longer applies. It has shortened, and I hope it will be in person. I would really I, I, love to sit right next to you rather than be right next to you on a screen. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. And thanks to everybody who's watched, and, and thank you for those who sent in questions which you tried to weave into the conversation. Thank you.